Hello, everybody, and welcome to a, another day of Better Idiot Office Hours. Uh, this is a service of the University of Michigan's Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics, specifically for the class Bioinformatics 529, Bioinformatic Algorithms and Concepts. It's kind of like an intro course, graduate level intro course. Uh, our main language that we use in the class, our, our, our Actually, our only language that we use, as far as programming is concerned, is Python. And we're going to continue to explore some of these algorithms from the lens of Python. Now, granted, not every, uh, every algorithm is best suited for Python because of uh, compu computational uh, inefficiencies, uh, so on and so forth. So. Uh, with that in mind, today's topic is going to be hidden Markov models. So I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time. I'm just going to jump right into this. When we're talking about hidden Markov models, okay, I don't think you guys are seeing it. Let's see what happens here. It's pointing to the wrong thing. It's my bad. All right, there we go. And I'm probably gonna have to change this here. And yeah, that's the reason. Let me do some housekeeping real quick and I'll be, I'll be right with you. Just got to change one of these. Uh, so hopefully you guys are doing all right today. If you feel free to, send any message in the chat. I'll constantly be watching it uh, throughout the office hours. Today is going to be a little lengthy one because we have a full-on description of, of something that's going on, uh, a very uh, complex algorithm. Now, in the grand scheme of things, it's actually uh, a pretty simple concept uh, once you get used to it. Uh, but admittedly, it is very difficult to... Uh, it's very difficult to wrap your head around at first. So, sorry, uh, some of my broadcasting stuff had kind of got all messed up. And okay. So, just bear with me as I do this. We're going to, I'm just going to be fiddling around. Don't worry about with what I'm doing right now. It's, it's not really super detrimental. Uh, I just got to resize some stuff and clean it up. Apparently there are some, some of the configurations were overwritten between two of the settings. Okay. So we'll get to that in a second. Right now, let's concentrate on what are we talking about as far as the hidden Markov model? What is a hidden Markov model? Uh, hidden Markov models are uh, were originally developed. Um, actually, I'm not even going to speak to that. Hidden Markov models are super helpful when we're doing uh, voice recognition or uh, computer vision processing for uh, gestures and stuff like that. And that is one of the predominant use, use cases of it. But with respect to genomics, uh, hidden Markov models have become ex especially helpful in trying to determine some underlying states of chromatin and so on and so forth. So because it's such a widely used uh, concept in genomics, we particularly uh, address it in 529. A more important reason of why we cover it in 529, uh, again, 529 is the class at the University of Michigan's Department of Bioinformatics, uh, or Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics. Uh, the reason that we use this as a training uh, feature, a training outlet, is because the algorithm teaches a lot of things to uh, new students. Some of these things include uh, dynamic programming, uh, indexing, slicing, these kind of intermediate to advanced level concepts of programming uh, we really, this algorithm does a terrific job of really 
bringing those introductory uh, those introductions or those uh, beginner students into the fold of understanding how some of these algorithms work. Furthermore, because of how they work, it uh, it strengthens the programmer down the down the road because now they have these concepts in their head. How can I address specific points in an array? How do I broadcast things in across an array? There's a lot of aspects of this uh, algorithm that are really helpful fundamentally to programmers. And that's why this isn't always just for bioinformatics. There's a lot of fields that cover this. Okay, so what you guys are seeing here is just a, it's just a generic hidden Markov model graph. And as you can see, like it's so generic, it's off of Wikipedia. Now, I think it's very appropriate to explaining what's going on, but a lot of times this is the first thing students get slammed with when they start talking about hidden Markov models. And anybody that understands HMMs, and that's what I'm gonna call them from here on out, HMMs, uh, anybody that understands them, this kind of diagram makes perfect sense. We understand what's going on to some degree. Now, the, this is a very basic version of a hidden mark of, of an HMM graph. Uh, they can be increasingly uh, or exceedingly complex. Uh, I'm, I think I'm having a problem with speaking today. It's kind of cold here in Michigan. Maybe that's it. Got a little space heater blowing on me right now. Okay, so anyways, usually uh, instructors give this HMM graph and just expect the students to almost readily understand. And if they're, if they're uh, cognizant of the fact that this may be a foreign concept to these programmers, a lot of times uh, they can go and actually start walking through the graph to kind of explain. But honestly, this is a lot of data. This is a lot of ink thrown at a student that may not even know what this concept is. So in the vein of trying to be that helpful educator, let's talk about what this graph represents. So very, the very beginning, you can see this start, this very, the, the, the start condition, because uh, the idea is out of nothing, out of nothingness comes something, right? We, we can't start from just some random spot. We have to have a deliberate entry point into this model. And that deliberate entry point is saying, uh, on any given day, it can be rainy or sunny. And granted, this is a very simple model. Obviously, there's a whole lot of other types of weather and climate patterns and blah, 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 blah. But in this case, they're saying, if in the start condition, on the, any given day, you have a 60% chance that it's raining. This is like if you live in Seattle, I guess. No, if that was Seattle, it'd be like 0.9. And then if you, uh, on any other day, it, or any, you have a 40% chance of it being sunny. Now, given this pattern of rainy and sunny, they're saying that if it's sunny one day, the likelihood or the probability that it's going to be rainy the next day is 0.4. And uh, it's, if it's sunny on the day we're on right now, it's likely that the next day, the 60% chance likely that it's going to be sunny the next day. And the same thing can be said on rainy. If it's rainy one day, the next day, it's a 70% chance that it's going to be rainy the next day, so on and so forth. But here we have the emissions. So that, that's all the, called the transitions. This is called the initialization. Now we have the emissions. So on any given day, what are the likelihoods of these specific events occurring? Now, what this means is, from uh, an observer's standpoint, somebody that's not actually in this model, somebody that's watching the, uh, the output of this model, all you see as that observer are the emissions. What do the people do? What do the things in the model do? So in case of this model, the only thing the observer sees is the person's walks, the person shops, and the person cleans. Uh, then they can know the sequence of events, like what days of the week uh, that this particular model is looking over. But the observer doesn't know these. They, they know that these, there are states there, but they can't directly observe those states at any given time. So the idea here is to look at the pattern of em emissions to determine or to identify some traits about these hidden states in the middle, to understand some of these, these things. So 
so with respect to this, we have if it's sunny, somebody's more likely to go on a walk than they are to stay home and clean. Versus if it's rainy, somebody's more likely to stay home and clean than they are to go on a walk. Common sense. But again, this kind of frame of mind to a beginner student in these fields can actually be very painful because it's not completely elucidated to them what's going on. So I'm going to do a quick illustration. I've just kind of written this up uh, to see if I can do it in a little bit more tangible way, because some of the most uh, classical ways of approaching HMMs is talking about loaded dice or an unfair coin or casinos, just regular statistics, psychobabble stuff. So I wanted something a little bit more tangible and a little bit more international. And that's when I came up with this concept of the M&M's focus group. Now, the M&M's focus group is a scenario that I know can speak to all nations. So here's the scenario starting out. The Mars Candy Company has long felt that there are too many colors in a bag of M&M's and are putting together some focus groups or groups to figure out uh, what are some, which of the colors they need to remove. Since it is early in the 1940s, and here's part of the scenario, whatever, we're role-playing. Uh, since it's early in the 1940s, Mars doesn't have the technology to remove colors from their uh, production system easily. However, since the Great Depression just ended, there's plenty of men to help out, and they're looking for a job. So here's our, here's our concept. Each man is going to come up one at a time and walk up to a conveyor, a conveyor belt. And at that same time, that conveyor belt is going to push out a single M&M. And if that man sees the chosen color that, the, that they're removing uh, for this spe the specific focus group, he picks it up off the conveyor belt and walks to the end of the line. If it's not the color that they're looking for, he just leaves it there and walks to the end of the line. That's all, his, all their jobs are to walk up, pick up an M&M or not pick up an M&M based off of whatever the color the CEO wants to remove for a specific uh, focus group. So after each iteration of removing colors, the CEO wants to change up which color is removed for the next focus group. So here's another assumption that each focus group, we only have one color removed. So if we remove brown the first group and then we move blue from the next group, the second group isn't missing both brown and blue. They're only missing blue. Okay. So a little bit of information. There are six colors of M&Ms in original plain chocolate M&Ms, milk chocolate M&Ms. There's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and brown. So the right now, you're going to be playing the role of the, uh, of the man in the line that's removing M&Ms. And right now the CEO says, we are removing brown from this specific iteration of M&Ms. So keep that in mind, you're gonna be removing brown. So let's get ready. The first guy walks up to the conveyor belt and he sees this. What does he do? Does he take it or leave it? And again, we have a little reminder of what color we're removing, just brown down here. I'm going to say we Take it, because it's brown. We want to remove it. What about this one? Doesn't look brown to me, so I'm going to leave it. Same concept. Doesn't look brown. I'm going to leave it. Ah, this looks brown. I'm going to take it. This doesn't look brown. I'm going to leave it. Again, leave it. Leave it leave it. I'm trying to show all the colors. And so here we're still taking brown. I'm going to give you a second because this is like, I don't know if this is a bad photo or whatever, but the person in line has walked up and they saw this M&M. To me, my gut check says this is brown, so I'm going to leave it or I'm going to take it. Sorry. I'm going to take it because it's brown. Here's red. I'm going to leave it. Blue, going to leave it. And then brown once again. I'm going to take it. Okay, so when we look at this and we look through all these colors of M&Ms, we saw that 
we knew that from the CEO's perspective, the sequence of M&Ms were known. Brown, uh, yellow or orange or whatever, off color, orange, brown, yellow, green, orange, so on and so forth. So we actually see which actual time, what times, oh, have I been talking this whole time and it hasn't been showing? That's great. That means I have to back up. Okay. That's, so I, have I been talking this whole time and not showing anything? Let me go from the top. Sorry, be patient with me. So that you can see this. Again, the M&M's Focus Group, the Mars Candy Company. Uh, here's just the, the information. Uh, again, going through the problem. Doesn't have the technology to remove the colors from their production system. So here we're saying, since it's the early 1940s, the Great Depression has just finished. Uh, so there's plenty of men that are still unemployed and they're looking for a job. The, each man walks up to the conveyor belt one at a time. And if the M&M he sees is the chosen color, he removes it. Otherwise, he just leaves it on the conveyor belt, uh, and then he goes to the end of the line. No matter what, if he takes it, he goes to the end of the line. If he leaves it, he still goes to the end of the line. The idea is uh, it's an uncertain order or sequence of people walking up to the conveyor belt. After each iteration of removing the color, the CEO wants to change up which color goes to the next focus group, so each focus group only has one, one color removed from their bag of M&Ms. So here we have the colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, brown. Again, you guys all heard me say this, so I'm just kind of flying through this, this part. The important part was for the next section. We're going to be removing brown. So here we go again. I'm trying to give a very good visual, but apparently my computer broke down. Uh, do we take this or leave this? We're removing browns, so I would take it. The next guy in line walks up to here. Does this look like a brown? No, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to take it. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it. Leave it. That looks brown. Take it. Leave it. Leave it. Take it. Okay, so now we're back up to where uh, we were before. I real before you guys let me know what was going on. Here's the scenario that we're up at to at here's the sequence of M&Ms and then we can actually the CEO can actually look at the observations. So they don't know anything about the men in the line. All they know is what the men chose to do when they saw this specific M&M. Okay? So, given that very generic example, let's break this down to a very simple, very simple uh HMM graph. So here we have some initialization or initiation point. And in this case, we're saying that it will always initialize to some guy in line. The next guy in line, the very first guy in line, there's a 100% chance that there's going to be a guy in line. Given some state, we don't know anything about this state, but the likelihood that there's going to be another guy in line because they just keep on replacing is 100%. The emission here, in this given scenario, is whether or not the person chooses to take the M&M or to leave the M&M. So in this case, what would be the probability of this per of any given guy walking up to the conveyor belt and taking the M&M off the off the conveyor belt? Well, that should be as simple as it's one sixth. There's out of the six colors, there is one brown out of all six. So one six take it, and five-sixths, the, uh, the probability is five-sixths for them just leave it on the conveyor belt. Now that seems really, really simple, and honestly, this is the most generic version of an HMM that you could possibly find. So let's move on. Let's try another test. Let's go for the next focus group. The idea here is the chosen color to be removed is green. Let's get ready. Take it or leave it. Is this green? 
Nope, I'm going to leave it. That's blue. I'm going to leave it. Green, I'm going to take it. It's yellow, I'm going to leave it. Yellow, leave it. Blue, leave it. There's that brown again. I'm going to leave it. There's a blue, leave it. There's a red, leave it. There's a yellow, leave it. Okay, so that's the fun part about this. What if I told you, because remember, this is a gigantic line of men. What if I told you the people in line were colorblind? Would that make you change your choices on the previous selections? I hope it would. So let's go through that again with the mindset of every guy that walks up has the possibility of being colorblind. Now, it could be any form of colorblindness. So let's go through those again. Do you take it or leave it? I'm going to leave it. It's not green. Leave it. Take it. Leave 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 it. Okay, so I'm going to mess with your minds here. I was supposed to have like the notes, but my computer went down. So give me a quick second to, to look at this real quick. So if we go through that second scenario, I'm just going to write these down real quick because of fun. Uh, some fun logistics issues, and I apologize for that. As you can see, I'm doing it the very last minute. Usually try to be a little bit more polished than that, but that's the fun of it. Winter, work, that. Thank you for bearing with me. Okay, so I'm going to bring that back up. The same exact sequence that we already saw, I think. You guys are still seeing this, yeah. The same exact sequence you already saw. Do we take this or leave it? We leave this. This one's brown. What about this one? What do you think this one is? This one's blue, right? This one's green. Now, remember, this is for color blindness. This one is actually green if the person is red blind or uh, protonopic. This one is, oops, there we go. This one is orange if the person is green blind. This one is green if they're yellow blind. Yellow blind is like the smallest proportion of people being blind. Uh, colorblind. This one is red if the person's red blind. So remember that previous, the previous iteration, this was the off-looking brown one that we said, oh, that's a brown. We're going we're gonna to take it. Well, that was actually a red, and the person in line was red blind. This one's blue. This one's uh, orange. Again, this is green. This one's green if the person's red blind. So from the concept of being uh, colorblind, the sequence has changed. Furthermore, now, as much as that was a little unwieldy, I hope it makes a, a good uh, illustration, a good tangible illustration of something that the observer, the CEO, would not know about any given point in time about the people in the line. They know nothing about the people in the line other than that they're just going to take the M&M or leave it. Now we can think about it as there's this bias of some of those men are likely to be colorblind. Furthermore, exacerbated by this is if we look at all this frequentist research that went on, the distribution of M&M colors per bag differ. It's not completely uniform. So if something's brown, where our previous one said that if uh, the likelihood of somebody taking a brown one, it wasn't one-sixth. It's actually 0.3. See these biases that we didn't really take into account? This one's easy to know. 
However, let's look at colorblind. So in this picture, the top left corner are six of the original M&M uh, milk chocolate colors, original milk chocolate M&M colors. Now this image is just repeated three more times under each of the different color blinds. So up here is if somebody were to be green colorblind in the upper right, in the lower left is if somebody were red colorblind, and then the bottom right is if somebody was blue colorblind or tritinopic. This one's uh, red is protonopic and uh, green is deuteronopic. So uh, the percentage of men affected by colorblindness is about 9%. And then we see the breakdown of the different color uh, color blindnesses. So if we whoops, if we go back to this PowerPoint, and if we go back to this idea of an HMM graph, our a HMM graph got a whole lot more complex because it's not just oh the next guy in line is guaranteed to just go there and take one. Now we have that initialization of whether or not somebody is not colorblind. That's going to the right, and if somebody is colorblind, going to the left because now we know those probabilities. Well, we don't know what the likelihood of somebody being a colorblind person in line, the next person in line being colorblind. Now, if we give these people the opportunity to talk to each other or whatever, colorblind people may group up together. Who knows? We can always assume that every person in, like the colorblind people will be uniformly distributed uh, uh, throughout the line. So that would mean they would have a uh, about a 1% chance, or sorry, yeah, about 10% uh, chance that the next person in line is going to be colorblind and a 90% chance that the person is not going to be colorblind. Furthermore, and here's the fun part about this, if the person's not colorblind, they're likely, or the probability that if the color were green at the conveyor belt, the probability of them taking it is about 10%. And that goes back to this. If, for number four, if it's a green M&M, 10% of most M&Ms in the milk chocolate original M&Ms uh, are green. So here's there's a 10% chance that they remove it from the uh, conveyor belt, and now a 90% chance that they leave it. Now, if we consider colorblind people, if we look at this green, this green in this corner, in the upper left-hand corner, the second row, this green if you look at it through the lens of somebody that's colorblind, they could almost confuse red, green, and orange as all being the same color. So that tells me that they have, and if we see that red, green, and orange, if we go here, red 20%, green 10%, and orange 10%, that tells us that they have a 40% chance likelihood of taking the green. And then a 60% chance of them leaving it. So now we see that there's these biases that an HMM can actually somewhat account for so long as we know some starting values. I hope that was a helpful illustration, illustration but now let's get into the coding. I just kind of wanted to solidify some of this information for you guys. Um, before I jump right into this, I'm going to take a second. I'm going to go to uh, chat and see what you guys are thinking. Do you guys have any thoughts or, or specific questions related to any of this, or should I just keep going on? I'm sorry for dragging that out. The actual implementation will go a lot smoother. Thank you, Alex. By the way, if you guys didn't know, this is Twitch TV. And if you're watching live and you want notifications and not have to deal with Canvas emails for the class, uh, if you're on a mobile device, if you look above you, the little heart, if you click that, you'll actually start following me. Otherwise, if you're on a PC or Mac, it should be down below. There should be a little heart. No matter where it is, there's a heart. Click that and follow me. Uh, you'll get notifications of when I start my Twitch streams. I'm not trying to go for like the whole, I want people to subscribe to me or no, I don't want any monetary value. It's just a matter of uh, metrics on whether or not this is actually being helpful to people uh, if they're considering coming back and watching more. All right, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm gonna move on to the implementation. 
So now that we've done the quick illustration, let's go to this idea of what we have from the class GitHub. The class GitHub, uh, this link, you can also, if you go to the uh, my GitHub repo under Office Hours, so Better Idiot, uh, let me see if I can put it here. Um, GitHub. Actually, Alex, if Alex or uh, Patrick, if you could go to the GitHub and pull that up and just post it in chat, so somebody else may be able to find it. It's uh, it's GitHub.com, better idiot, and then the repo is Office Hours. So uh, this, if you go to that Office Hours and pull that repo, this is actually a notebook that I already have posted. Once I fill it in today after Office Hours. I'll push those to GitHub so you have that resource available. But you already have this link. This goes to the class GitHub for Bioinformatics 529. And in there, we have the example implementation that Dr. Alan Boyle uh, created when he was going over this lesson initially. So in here, there's some things that he has for initializing the uh, HMM. Now, I'm not going to be wor worrying about that class or anything like that right now. I'm just going to be going straight into, let's get this HMM set up while we have the m &Ms concept still solidified in our brain. So when we talk about the alphabet we're going to be using, that is the actual letters, the actual sequence uh, that is seen uh, by the CEO. So this is like the, uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, thank you, Alex. So the, this is like the series of people that are going to be seen in here. So the idea of this is if I just, this is in the case of, uh, bioinformatics, we can talk about, uh, what about if it's DNA? So this is why the M&M's, uh, uh, m and illustration is super helpful because we, if we think about these things in the respect of colors, what happens if m and uh, we can always say that the m and color is some variation of a nucleotide. So yes, we have six colors. Yes, the L illustration kind of breaks down in some, in some cases. But what if we said A, C, G, and T? If we think about this in the broad scope of things, A, C, G, and T, when they're sequenced using like Illumina technology, it's sequencing by synthesis. And the special thing about sequencing by synthesis is the way that the, the machinery determine whether or not that's an A, a C, a G, or T is when that nucleotide actually is, is ligated to the uh, building strand, the, the uh, nascent strand, it actually lets off a certain fluorescence, a specific color. So A, C, G, and T all have different colors for which, uh, for, or each have specific colors to them in and of themselves. So when they fluoresce a specific color, the machine will pick up those, those fluorescents and say, okay, that thing was a blue. So in this case, we can think of if we're going along DNA. So instead of going along a, a string of men uh, in this conveyor belt line, and in, uh, instead of saying, oh, they've either taken the m and or they left it, think about it in, through the view of DNA. What if we're going through this DNA? Is this DNA uh, euchromatinized or heterochromatinized, or is it an enhancer region? There's tons of research which says we look at these states, the, these emissions at the very end, and through those emissions, is, was it picked up as an A, C, G, or T? Can we look back at the sequence and determine some characteristic of the sequence from that? Um, so here, when we think about A, C, G, and T DNA, we can look at, think of those as colors and have a direct corollary to the m and illustration. Okay, I'm gonna stop beating it over the head. Um, so here our alphabet is just A, C, G, and T. Now the next part are the hidden states. Now the hidden states in our example, the, uh, the M&M's example was colorblind and not colorblind. But in the example that was used in class is, is it intronic or genomic, or is it a CPG island, or is it just genomic region, uh, however way you wanna see it. And those are just a series of letters. So we're going to say IG. Now, it doesn't have to be letters. It just has to be some iterable. It could be a tuple of names. It could be numbers. It doesn't matter. 
In this case, we're just using letters. Okay, so now we have the initial probabilities. Now this initial probabilities, if you think back to the M&M example, is what is the likelihood that the first person in line is going to be colorblind versus not colorblind? In the same case here, as we're saying, uh, if we're looking at these initial probabilities, and again, I'm just doing a lot of copying pasting. If we look at those initial probabilities, we say that there's a 10% chance that it's an uh, uh, a CPG island and 90% chance that it's a genomic region. Some, something like that. I'm just going to keep calling them an IG so that I don't have to sit here and deal with the biology. So that's just saying the first person in line, what is it? So now we see the transition probabilities. Now the transition probabilities, if we go back to the M&M &M example, is what was the likelihood that the next person in line was going to be colorblind following the previous guy? So in this, the transition probabilities is, is in our example, uh, described as a dictionary of dictionaries. So here we're saying if it's I, the likelihood that it'll be I next is 60%, and if likelihood that it'll be G next is 40%. So if we were thinking about this through the lens of the colorblind versus not colorblind, if I were to be colorblind, the likelihood of somebody being colorblind next in line is 60% and not colorblind is 40%. Just keep on going back to that colorblind thing, make it a little bit more tangible. And now the last is the emission probabilities. And in our example, the M&M example, this is whether or not the person actually took the M&M off the conveyor belt. And in this case, instead of thinking about whether or not they take it or leave it, this is what base is called, what nucleotide base is called. So if it's an A, C, G, or T, what is the likelihood that they'll happen? So in this, uh, for a CPG island, we expect a C and a G to be more prominent in a CPG island than uh, compared to regular genomic areas. That's all the setup of a hidden Markov model needs. The only other thing outside of that is you need some sequence to actually process using specific algorithms. Now there's different algorithms. In class we used the Viterbi algorithm, but there's the forward, the backward, the forward, backward. And yes, I know that sounds like I just was redundant, but there's the forward algorithm, the backward algorithm, and the forward, backward algorithm. It, whatever. <laughs> Science. Uh, so that's the setup. Now let's look at this uh, data structure, and I'm just going to uh, copy that directly. Actually, no, I'm going to develop it on my own. I'm going to do a little bit of live coding, if you guys are ready for that. The very first thing that we need to worry about are what are the things that we're going to be using? Because again, we have a blank canvas. Besides having the, uh, the setup, we have a blank canvas. We haven't actually written any of the the algorithm yet. So the things we're going to need are going to be uh, import numpy as np, and then I'm going to do a sub, yeah, import numpy as np, and then I'm going to add one more thing here, and if you were in the, the Markov chain uh, office hours I did last, I used this before too, I'm going to be importing JSON. And the only reason I import this uh, module is to visualize these dictionaries later on because Python's not always not always super helpful in printing out dictionaries. So that's all I need as far as imports are concerned. Okay, so let's go through the class. Now I'm going to do this from scratch so you guys see it and you don't feel like it's just a lot of copy and paste, especially when it comes to these classes. So let's go right from the top. I'm going to create a class called HMM. Okay, so this HMM is the hidden Markov model. These, this is what's going to hold all the information related to our, uh, our probabilities that we've already defined and how they're processed. And the idea of a class is we are taking a cogent group of functions and attributes, all things that come together to create one big picture, one big coherent picture that all rely on each other. And we put it into a nice, pretty package called a class. Okay. Additionally, just for the fun of it, I'm going to be going over some more advanced level or intermediate level uh, object-oriented programming uh, if we have time.
because I spent a lot of time on that M&M thing, apparently. So the very first thing we want to start doing, oh, come on. I got a different keyboard, so now my fingers are all messed up. All right, so uh, we're going to do our module level or our class level doc string. So doc strings are super simple. It's not anything painful. The things that are actually going to be available, remember there's a difference between attributes and methods. Uh, the attributes that are going to be available are alphabet. Now, if you were following along with what was given in class, um, I'm going to do things a, a touch different. Uh, I'm just going to copy and paste the link. I'm going to do things a touch different in some of the notation. And just pay attention to that. It actually doesn't break any of the implementation. It just makes things a little clearer for me. So here, our class level uh, doc string are just what attributes are available to this object. And that's alphabet, which is the uh, alphabet that we're using, the hidden states, the initial probabilities, the transition probabilities, and the emission probabilities. That's all we need for that. So uh, the next part I'm going to do because I'm gonna have some stuff, and I'm, this is one of those cool things about uh, object-oriented programming in Python. We kind of start hiding stuff from the user because maybe there's some stuff going on behind the scenes that the user doesn't really need to get, uh, get wrapped around the axle about or focused on because it just doesn't help them as far as understanding the concept. And this is something that's particularly special or important in education. So to introduce this, it, topic, what we're going to do is we're going to create this class level attribute called all. And all all does is it just holds a list. And inside this list are just the names of things that are that this particular uh, object will have access to. So we already have seen this, we have alphabet, and this is going to look really redundant because I just typed it up here in my doc strings. But this is just me going through and listing out all the things that uh, this object has. Trans jobs. Real boring stuff right now. Initial. All right. Um, I'm also going to add a couple other things in here, uh, or I'm going to add one more thing in here called Viterbi. And Viterbi is the method that we were writing in class uh, for the Viterbi algorithm. Now, why I did this isn't particularly clear to you right now, but you'll see why in just a second. Okay, so the very first thing that you do with classes, generally speaking, is create an init method. And this is saying when I initialize, when I create this class, I need to create something. And, or I'm going to have a specific set of attributes or values that I need to add to that class. And this is called the constructor, if you're worried about that. And the things that this needs when we create it are alphabet, uh, the hidden states, and I'm going to say the beta or the initial probabilities, and I'm going to set the default to none. Uh, trans probabilities, come on, wait. Equals none. Uh, emit probs equals none. So now I'm saying that these are the arguments. This is the signature that my object needs when I create it. I'm going to copy and paste the doc strings because my fingers are all sorts of wonky today. So how are you guys doing today? You can feel free to uh, talk to me in chat. I have it open. I will see it. So uh, I will respond if you have any questions. Okay, so when we come to this, there's a lot of this is actually going to look very similar to what we saw in class. Self dot alphabet equals set alphabet. Now, if you would have seen in class when we saw the initialization up here previously, 
Um, previously, you had seen that it was written as a tuple or a tuple, however pretentious way you want to say it. And that was like this. Type. That was like this. And then that was passed into the class. This isn't necessary specifically with strings because strings are still an iteratable. You can uh, iterate through a string perfectly fine. So even if I do if I do this and say set around this, it'll go, oh, wait, it got four arguments. But what if I set around a tuple like it was written in class? Excuse me. It'll, it'll break up that tuple and assign them to this class or to the set. But I don't even need to do that. I can just say ACGT and set will do that itself. It'll iterate through whatever iteratable it's given first and uh, break it up into pieces. So with that in mind, we have set alpha or set alphabet. And then we go with self dot and I'm just changing. I'm leaving those. I'm getting rid of those hit, uh, un leading underscores that were in the original implementation. If anything, it just confused people if they didn't know what they were. And it makes sense that people still may be uh, interested in having access to these specific attributes at any point during their model. Uh, the idea of a hidden, uh, of a, uh, leading underscore denotes a private attribute, a private variable. Um, and the concept behind that is saying whatever has this, it's meant because nothing's truly private in Python, but what it meant is if it has this leading underscore, it's intended that whoever sees this not to change it. They're supposed to go through some predefined API that's already been developed. But we're currently developing the API, so it's okay. Again, there's nothing sacred about the code that we use in class. Feel free to change it as long as the result is what we expect from class. Um, now I'm going to do, again, this is another fun thing, uh, is I'm adding my first private variable, and you'll see why I'm doing this in a little bit. So I create my uh, self dot uh, underscore B or beta self dot initial probs equals, and now I'm going to do some more intermediate Python stuff, and it's called a dictionary comprehension. Um, so the idea is with this is if you do, if we're working in the probability world and you have uh, 0.9 times 0.3 times 0.01, sooner or later, you're going to quickly uh, reach your underflow and you'll, you'll error out. You won't have floating point accuracy to keep track of that small of a number anymore. So one of the tips we gave you in class was to actually... Uh, uh, transform everything into the log space. And we can do this in a simple one-liner using key np.log10 uh, val for key val in b oh, data dot items. So the idea of this dictionary comprehension is I'm going to iterate through this dictionary by the key and the value. So it's good because remember dictionaries are just key value pairs and this is just the initial probabilities. So if you look at our setup, it's a dictionary, keys and values. It's gonna go through that one key, one value at a time and it's gonna create another dictionary. But all I'm doing is I'm changing that value from a floating point number, probability, or I should say from a probability to log space. Um, the next part self dot underscore t equals trans probs. Now, I'm hoping that while I'm typing this out, you guys are kind of thinking, why in the world is he doing this? Because don't feel like you have to type along if you don't want to, because remember, I'm going to be posting this code. I want you more to get the information out of this, of why I'm doing this. So while you see me doing these leading underscore things, kind of ask yourself, why would I be doing this? Why is this important? Why would it matter to me? Uh, self dot 
So transform dict props. Now I'm hoping that I just made you scratch your head and go, wait, what in the world is transform dict? And I'll explain in a second. Okay, so hopefully you thought about why did I have these leading underscore things. And the reason I did this is if you look at it, these are the original values that the user is providing the constructor, the original probability values. So it makes sense that when the user wants to interrogate the model, they want the information to come out to them in the, in the form that they submitted it. Unless told otherwise, they should assume that the data uh, is the same format as given, unless told otherwise. Again, unless told otherwise. So here I'm just saving that original data, but I'm actually hiding. Now, another special thing that you may have seen is that there's this self dot uh, underscore transform dict. That's a function we haven't written yet, and I'll show you. I'll write that here in a second. And all that's doing is essentially the same thing as uh, init probs right here, except uh, the difference is if we look at the dictionaries is that emission probabilities is actually a dictionary of dictionaries. It's a nested dictionary. So we have to go one more layer deeper and it's not, it, you can do it in a single one line dictionary comprehension, but when you start doing that long of a dictionary comprehension, it's really bad practice to do it. I know it works, but just because it works doesn't mean that you should do it. Um, the other part here is you see this under, under beta, under T and under E, those aren't in this underscore all. Just kind of pointing this out and I'll show you why this is important in a second. But now that I have my init created, oh, I good code reader. Now that I have my uh, init created, I'm gonna move on to the next part. And the next part I'm going to do is this thing called transform dict. And I'm introducing another intermediate uh, Python uh, practice, and these are called decorators. And specifically, this one is called static method. When you're writing something inside a class, generally speaking, that class is always going to look, look inward to itself. So we have init, so, and its first argument is always self. It's always looking at itself. Well, static methods are special because they don't care about self. They just care about the data it's given. It's kind of a way to create a uh, function that you could write anywhere else in your code. It doesn't have to be in a class, but because this is pertinent to the class, I'm putting it in here. But it doesn't rely on any outside information. So I'm going to say def uh, transform dict, and all I'm going to give it is a nested dict. And I'm going to copy and paste some doc strings so that I don't have to do it later. And all we're doing is transforming some nested dictionary into uh, a nested dictionary of probabilities into a nested dictionary of, of log 10 transformed uh, probabilities. Um, so out dict equals some empty dictionary. And for key outer subdict, remember it's a nested dictionary, in nesteddict.items. So here I'm cracking open that dictionary. It's a dictionary of dictionaries. So the first one is going to be the outer, There's this is the outer dictionary, right? So that I'm gonna get the first key and I'm gonna get the first sub dictionary. And from here, I want to say for key inner, and value, because we know that the probabilities, th this is the second layer, so the va this is actually the value, in subdict.items. And I'm going to put this into outdict.setDefault. Again, one of my favorite functions, set default key outer. So here I'm just like recreating the dictionary. So I'm saying the outer key is this, and if it doesn't exist in outdict, I'm going to create an empty dictionary as its 
a value. And then I'm going to update it with the uh, key inner and np.log10 val. Close that out. And then return out dict. Now, I create this function so that I turn everything into a, uh, a log 10 transformed probability once. Now, here's the important part about efficiency. If you look at some other implementations or other people that do this, every time they experience a probability and then they transform it to NP log 10 with NP log 10, that's just an additional function call every single time that they transform something. And especially since we're doing uh, more than one iteration through a sequence or different states, that's a lot of additional function calls we don't need to do. So if we do this once at the very beginning and then treat everything else in log space, uh, as logs, we should be perfectly fine and actually be more efficient in the long run. So what this says is, if we go back to this transform dict, is we're saying uh, when the person gives us emit probabilities, it's going to convert all those probabilities into log 10 transformed probabilities. Okay, I'm going to do some additional fun for just the fun of it. We're going to create a uh, the uh, dunder string method. And this, this determines that if we create an object using this HMM, uh, a lot of times users are very interested on like, what's the progress? What, where are they at? What, what, is, what are the properties of this specific object as it stands? So a lot of people say print. It's the same concept as if you're going through a data frame in R, a lot of people do head because they want to just quick peek into what they're working with. The same thing applies to this HMM. And because HMMs are such a uh, abstract concept for a lot of people, I'm creating this to make it a little bit more straightforward or uh, give people steps along the way in prototyping on what their actual model looks like at any given time. So all this is is a bunch of F strings. I'm gonna copy and paste this because uh, my fingers are not liking quotation marks today. So I'm still going to walk through it. The idea of this dunder string is this is what ha this function is what's called whenever you call print on an object. So when we call print on this specific object, it creates this list. And then this list is then turned into one giant string. And what we're saying is when you say print on whatever this model is, it tells you what the alphabet was. It tells you what the hidden states you, you submitted were. And then it does this json.dump. So this is the reason why I imported JSON early on. Because JSON allows us to dump dictionaries, because if anybody knows, JSON is just a JavaScript object notation, which is essentially just a dictionary of dictionaries of dictionaries of dictionaries of dictionaries, blah, blah, blah. So under that same concept, I'm taking those dictionary of dictionaries and then dumping them as dictionary, or dumping them using JSON to make them a little bit more visually appealing. Now, because the user submitted things as plain probabilities, I want them to see and to think that, or I should say, I want them to see and know that the model's working with the numbers that they've provided. Granted, we've transformed them, but we still want to be that transparent with the user, or I guess in this some way deceptive. Uh, so we're taking those original probabilities that they gave us and we're just giving them back to them. That's all. And then at the very end, because this, this is one giant list, I join them by a new line and then it'll print out that model. To see this in action, I know we haven't done anything with this yet, but to see this in action, if we just do this, where's my invalids? Oh, I have insert on. Okay, so if we do this as, it's, as it stands, we can say um, HMM, and we already have alphabet. We've already defined alphabet. We've already defined hidden states. Our um, beta is already initial probabilities. Our 
uh, trans probs is transition probabilities and our emit probs are emission probabilities. So if I do this and then I wrap it all in this print, you'll see it right here now that it'll print out the model as the model sees it to this point. This is super helpful uh, when you're looking at these objects and trying to make sure that you didn't accidentally change things along the way or whatever. Anyways, uh, that's just some f fun Python, Python flair. The next part I'm going to be doing is, uh, the next decorator is called a class method. And what what's special about a class method is instead of saying like the static method where it doesn't matter about itself, it, it, it only cares about the data it's given, uh, versus a, uh, a class method, or sorry, not class method, a method, an object in, uh, objects method, um, where it does worry about itself, a class method says, I only carry a, care about the category in which I, I belong to. So the, uh, the signature looks a little different, and I'm going to be doing another special uh, dunder method called dict. And instead of self, I'm going to say CLS. This means I'm looking at the class, the actual class of HMM. So if you remember, these are all functions, these are all methods within the class. Well, now I want to look at something within the class, not something within the object itself. And all I'm going to say is return, and this is the special magic here. I'm going to say CLS dunder all. That's where all comes in. So in this same case that we had here below where I did the print, I'm going to delete that print, and I'm going to assign something to A. I'm going to assign that HMM to A, and it works perfectly fine, no errors, whatever. The fun part about this now is what if I say dir on A? On a? What if I want to get the directory of A? What we... Did I not run that? Oh, did I do dick? There we go. Sorry. So instead of dict, it was supposed to be dir. I overwrote what happens when the user calls dir on the object. So now instead of that big long list of uh, leading underscore stuff, we own, it's only showing the things that we told the user about up here in all. So here's that list of things we said that this class has. And now we've overwritten what happens when that dir method is called on that object uh, versus if we didn't do this to see the difference, see all that other stuff that gets a little confusing to intro people or people that are uh, not firmly or pretty solid in the foundation of Python stuff. Okay. The, the last part that I'm going to be going over is actually the reason you guys all came, and that is we're going to be talking about the Viterbi algorithm. So let's get dig right into it. The Viterbi algorithm is a special algorithm that depending on the sequence, the design, uh, the, the design, sorry. It uses the sequence and goes through and iterates through that sequence one item at a time and tests that that specific item against the hidden Markov model, the model that we've already defined. And based off scores, we'll actually uh, determine at the very end, it'll go or it'll determine the most likely path along the uh, sequence it, for whatever. It just gives us the optimum path through an HMM given the model parameters. So uh, it's special in that in the fun way of dynamic programming is we're constantly keeping track of where we were. However, a very naive approach that a lot of people take when they're writing Viterbi algorithms are they try to store every possible probability. And thank you for whoever started following me. I didn't see it in chat. I just heard it. Um, it instead of keeping track of 
a lot of naive people or wow that was mean a lot of people naively just try to store every probability along every step of the way and think that they're just going to backtrace through uh, and just find a bunch of maxes that's not the way to go on a small scale small sequence that's not a big deal but when we start talking about this in a genomic context that is a tremendous a tremendous amount of information you have no idea how tremendous amount of information that is to the degree that it potentially won't even load so uh, we have to think uh, computer science wise how can we make this as efficient as possible without keeping as much as ne uh, as necessary inside the function or inside uh, our computation cycle so i'm just going to copy and paste the doc string again because i know you guys don't find them nearly as interesting as i do okay so the idea of the alg of the Viterbi, Viterbi algorithm is we have to iterate through the sequence one base at a time. And I'm just going to break this uh, pseudocode down and uh, go through this one step at a time. Instead of looking at the gigantic algorithms that a lot of people look up, if you guys look on the examples, there was a lot of LaTeX that can actually really confuse people and think that instantly this is a giant math problem. It's not. And I guarantee you it's not because I'm not math. I hate math. Like, to no end. So the fact that I don't need to know math should help encourage you knowing that even though you saw all that LaTeX, it's not a big, uh, big deal. So the only thing, the only real thing that I need to keep track of is where my information came from. That's the only thing I care about. Where did my information come from? I don't need to keep track of the probabilities except for where am I at right now? So as we move along the sequence, one base at a time, uh, once we figure out I'm right here, this is where I came from, and then I go to the next step, I don't care about here anymore. I only care about this, the next moment in time, and then look back temporarily. Next moment in time, look back temporarily. Uh, or I should say, look forward. Um, so with this in mind, the only thing we need to store is the traceback. The next part is we need to figure out that initial initialization step. And the initialization step uh, is the probably the simplest part of this whole thing, especially when uh, when you consider the M&M's example. What is the likelihood that the first person in line is colorblind versus not colorblind? So here I'm just going to pull that first person out of line. I'm going to call it first base equals sequence not. And then I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to compute what are, at that very first instance, at the very beginning of the sequence, what are our probabilities? We need to initialize our probabilities. And I'm going to do this, I'm going to call it previous, and I'm going to do a big, giant dictionary comprehension again. And di dictionary comprehensions are actually super efficient uh, compared to writing the for loop out and then appending or updating and all that other stuff. There's actually lower level uh, internals that are going on at the C level that actually make uh, dictionary comprehensions, list comprehensions, generator expressions very quick. So the idea here, and I'm just going to kind of expand this a little bit with the dictionary comprehension if you didn't pick this up earlier, is I can say uh, for state in self dot hidden states. I want to go through each of the different hidden states that I have. And in this case, it's I and G. So for state in hidden states, and now I'm going to iterate through and create my new dictionary, my beginning uh, level of the, or the initial phase of my HMM, of my Viterbi algorithm. I'm going to say my key is state. And now I'm going to say self dot uh, uh, initial probabilities given the state that I'm in. And because we're now in log, so initial probability is saying, uh, if it's I, what's the probability of I? So what's the probability of that first person being colorblind? And now I'm going to say plus the self dot emit probabilities for that specific state and uh, my first base.
Now, I want to give that a second to sink in. What exactly happened here? The very, very first position is some letter. A, C, G, T, doesn't matter. It could be some letter. And we're saying the initial probability that this is, that this person is, and going back to the M&Ms, what's, what's the initial probability that, or the first person in line is colorblind? And what's the probability that they pick up that uh, M&M given that they're colorblind? And the reason I can do this plus now is because this is the math part. Since we've transformed the probabilities into the log 10, uh, we can just add logs together instead of multiplying probabilities together. And now that's as far as we need to go as far as initialization is concerned. This one line right here finishes up our initialization step. Anybody, if anybody thinks that's pretty fun, <laughs> I would agree. I don't know. That wasn't really very profound. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Now that we've gotten our first initialization done, now we need to do all the rest of the positions. And this is where things get very interesting and kind of head scratchy. And I'm going to bounce around a little bit here, uh, especially with writing some other functions. Uh, so just kind of hold on for the ride. Uh, we need to go through each of the sequences, so for or each of the bases in sequence. But I don't care. I don't care about that first position anymore, do I? I've already used it. So from here on out, I'm just going to say this. I'm just going to say from position one to the end because I've already used position zero. I don't want to reuse it. Okay. So now that I'm iterating through the bases one at a time. I'm going to write this line here, and then uh, that's when we're going to bounce to the next uh, function that I wrote. So, update previous, update traceback equals self.update probs, and I'm going to give it the base and previous. So, Hopefully your spidey sense is tingling and you go, wait, update probs doesn't exist yet. That's not a function. And but we can see this from this fun that this function requires the given base that we're on. It cares about where we were, what was the next, what was the previous step. And what it's going to give us is the new updated version. Like after we've looked at what where we've been, now it's going to go, okay, based off where we are, we can step, we can take the next step. So uh, I'm going to put a pin in this and we're going to go down and I'm going to create another function. So I'm going to back out of that and we're just going to temporarily put a pin in here. So uh, feel free to put a big note to do here if you want. It, it doesn't matter to me. And this is just to signify we're going to come back to this point in a second. But I want to start talking about this update probs. The update probs is probably the 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 meat of this uh, this whole uh, algorithm, at least for me. And again, there's many different ways. Don't feel like you have to do it this way to answer the question. You can do this many, many ways. This is just how Marcus uh, would use it, would do it. So def update probs and it. It is a it is an instance method, so it doesn't. I don't. It it still needs access to its own attributes, so no fancy decorators. It needs that base and the previous. I'm not going to do doc strings right here, just because I just kind of want to keep moving on. Uh, I'm going to say the current probability equals, or the current probabilities equal uh, empty dictionary, and the traceback uh, position equals. An empty dictionary. And these are just to store things as we iterate through them. So here when we talk about updating the probabilities, we're saying from where we're at, I want to take a glimpse into the future. What's the next state? What's the next potential state that I can be in and figure out whether or not uh, I'm actually going to, uh, if it's better for me or better for the algorithm, to move in that direction. Because remember, if you know about Viterbi algorithm, it's just finding the maxes along the way. So uh, let's iterate through those states because we just constantly have to iterate through each of those states. So for future, 
I'm going to call it future in self dot hidden states. So here we have our hidden states I and G. So for future, it's saying, given our current position, uh, what is, uh, and we look at our future position, what is the probability that I'm going to transition to this? So the, the idea of the M&M &M factory is, uh, is it more probable if I if the next person in line is colorblind versus are they not colorblind? What, when is that transition going to occur? So I'm going to call this next one is check. And the check is just to check for uh, the max probabilities at that given position. And you can go over the Viterbi algorithm uh, ad nauseum if you want to. I'm not going to sit here and dig into the math. All I'm going to say is uh, current... Uh, well, this is another dictionary comprehension. And I should probably say that. This is another dictionary comprehension. And it's going to be a little bit more chunkier, but it still works. For current in self.hidden states. Now, I'm hoping that some of you go, it seems kind of clunky to iterate through the same thing twice. Can't it, There should be a better way. There, there should be an easier way. And if all we were doing was trying to iterate through two lists at the same time, that is that is perfectly easy. And we can actually do something uh, here. I'm going to say from iter tools import product. And what product does is I'm going to say for i j, actually I'll create something. A equals one, two, three. B equals A, B, C. And now with product, I can say for i j, or uh, num let in uh, product, and then I'm going to give it to iterate our iterables a and b. Print num let, and what this will do is it'll go through the first one. It'll take the first iteration of the first one, so this is one against everything in the second. So one a, one b, one c, two a, two b, two c, three a, three b, three c. It's a really easy way to. Uh, repetitive, repetitively, repetitively uh, or get the Cartesian product of uh, something. But because we have some intermediate calculations that we have to do each step along the way, we can't do this in a single one line. And uh, you'll see why in a second. So just delete that. So here we have that for current in self hidden states. Now we get to the meat of it. We're saying, because remember, previous, if we look at previous up here, previous was a dictionary. And the dictionary is, uh, the key is the state. So I or G, or colorblind, not colorblind. And then the probability of that uh, state given that specific base. Okay? So the same concept applies down here. We say uh, current, that's the current state I'm in. And I'm going to look previously because I always have to look backwards in time to say, where did I come from? What was what what's the previous thing that happened? So using the top row or uh, if I'm colorblind, what is the likelihood of the person behind me being colorblind? Or, or I should say, was the person behind me in line colorblind? Or Yeah, that's kind of breaking down. Was the person in front of me colorblind? And that's what I'm saying is, uh, what was the probability that the person in front of me was colorblind? Plus uh self dot transprobs and I need to look at my current state and what's the probability of it being uh the different state, the other state, or the same state, or whatever iteration I'm on. Because if you remember it's a Cartesian product, it could be self versus self or self versus other. So I'm gonna say future. So what this does here in one line is quickly calculate all possibilities of uh, looking backwards in time one step for both the top row or the previous state versus the bottom row, uh, the other possible state in a two state HMM. Try to think of that visually when you look at that and when you think of a, a probabilities chart that is usually shown with a Viterbi algorithm, they usually show uh, like it's a biased coin, unbiased coin, or healthy versus unhealthy. Those are the two hidden states. And then uh, the probability here, probably you, they always have arrows pointing to things. This, this right here does all those computations in one line. Uh, now we need to figure out 
where in this particular column at this particular position are we at in the sequence where is that maximum probability where is the probability of the max so i'm just going to call this origin because again from where i'm at where did i come from that's why i call it origin where did i come from where was the maximum where did i get the maximum from and to do this i say equals max and i'm going to say check that thing that i just created and I'm gonna say key equals check dot get. Now, this is the same concept as if I were to use uh, np.argmax, uh, numpy's argmax, it'll tell you the index position of the maximum. This right here essentially does the same thing. It'll give us the index position of our, our maximum, but all using the default library or, or the standard library. I don't have to deal with using any NumPy, because remember, uh, function calls, especially NumPy function calls, there's a little bit of overhead in using it simply because NumPy is kind of a beast. It's awesome, it's great, but it it's, can be a little unwieldy at times. So in doing this, we're just finding where did my, because of the probability that I'm at right, or, or the, this maximum probability, I'm looking at it and I'm going, okay, how did I achieve this maximum probability? So I have to look back one step. And I figure out, did it come from being colorblind versus not colorblind? Which state caused me to be uh, where I'm at now? And that's all this is keeping track of. So uh, I have to create an update stage. So cur prob dot update. And I need to update it using the future state self.emit probs future and base. So uh, here we're saying, uh, actually, let me finish writing the math out real quick. Check. What I'm saying here is uh, I'm creating a new set of probabilities that I'm going to update my this previous up here, this previous that I created for my initial step, we're now in the second position of the of the sequence. So in the second position of the sequence, I have to update those probabilities. And that that's what this step is doing is I'm taking the uh, I'm taking a look at all those probabilities, and I'm creating a new uh, version of it so that I can overwrite it in the next step. And here I'm saying in this future step, uh, what what is the emission probability for a specific base, and then I add it to whatever that maximum origin was, whatever that max probability we just saw in the previous step. Because remember, check gives us all the probabilities for all possible states at that given position. And what this does is find out the probability of that base at that given position, given the, the, the maximum probability. Wow, this is kind of blowing my mind. Um, now I'm going to, I, again, remember the only thing we have to keep track of in the scheme of things, besides the probability of probabilities of where we're at right now, or the previous column, so to speak, is the traceback. So I need to keep a running tally of those. And I'm going to say traceback dot update is, uh, future and origin. So this says the next step, the next step, where did I come from? And that's what, or remember, origin is just the index position, if the person's colorblind or not colorblind, which, of that, what, which one of those was the one that created this maximum, right? Um, so now we're tying where it came from to where it's going, right? And that's all we're doing here. So we're doing that for each of the hidden states. And now that we're done with this, uh, we can back out of the for loop and say return cur prob. Oh, I see. Good thing I did that. Cur prob and uh, TB pause. That's the end of this update probs function. And again, I want to really highlight that this isn't the only way you can do this. There's lots of ways to do this. This is just how I do it. This is the, 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 the disclaimer. So now that this function, remember, if we look back up here where we actually use update probs, we give it base and previous. It gets base and previous. And what does it give back? Update previous 
an update traceback. And what does it give back? Current and traceback. So now we've fulfilled the contract with regard to uh, what we've written out on the update, pre uh, update probs. So let's go back to that to do. And now I actually got, I have to instantiate the, or actually create those updates. And I'm going to say, I'm going to overwrite previous with update previous, the new previous that I just created, that I just got from update props. And I need to add to traceback. So I'm going to say traceback dot end, and then I'm going to up add that update T. So now we've taken those things that we've seen along the lines with update probs and actually uh, added them to our model as it's, or added them to our algorithm as it stepped along. That's as far as this, like as far as the math is concerned, when it comes to the Viterbi algorithm, we're done. That's it. Uh, the, the last step here is just to find our traceback. How, what's the likely the most optimal path through this sequence. That's all that's left. Uh, all the complicated math is actually out of the way. And look at that. If we think about this in terms of math, there's one, there's two, there's three. Yeah, there's only three mathematical operations that we actually did. For me, that feel that's like a feel-good moment. Anytime I don't have to do math, good day. Okay, so... Like I said, we're now done with all the math. Now we have to go right into dealing with the traceback. And now how do we do that? Because part of the Viterbi algorithm is not only doing the math, but figuring out what that optimal path is based off the math. So the last step here is we need to develop what the optimal path is. So, and we always start from the back. Always remember, keep this in your head as we go through this. We're starting at the end of the sentence. We're starting at the end of the sequence. So at some point, we have to reverse everything that we get back. All right. So let's say result. And what is the result? Result is we finished the sequence. So we're at our termination step. Now that we're at our termination step, we have finished the sequence. We need to figure out which of those which of the two sequences, because remember we have I and G or colorblind, not colorblind. We have to figure out at the tail end of it, what is the most likely observation at the very end? And to do that, it's just another max call. Max previous, because we have to look at the last column that we were just at, uh, key equals previous dot get. Hey, that's the same trick we already did up uh, oh, right here. That's the same trick we already did. And all we're doing is doing the same exact thing we did down here, but instead of using it to check, we're just using it to on, onto uh, previous, which was just our previous column, our previous position. Now we have the index position of the most likely state that we were, that this sequence was in at the very end. So now we need to construct this all together. So if I'm starting at the end, I'm just going to have to keep on adding things up. So let's say result. Now, ask yourself real quick. The states. What type of object were the states? If we look back at this, the type of object the states are, are strings. Strings are special in that I can just append strings to each other. Just like you can increment a number, like uh, a equals one, then I could say a plus equals one, a plus equals one, a plus equals one. And that'll be like a equals four, a equals five, and so on and so forth. You could do the same thing with strings. So if I say some string plus equals another string, it'll just concatenate those strings together. So here I'm starting at the very end. This is my index position, or that's my most likely state. Now, given that state, I'm going to say self dot get traceback. I'm going to give it the traceback that I've been keeping track of up until now and the previous step I was on or the previous result I saw. Now again, your spidey sense should be tingling because get traceback doesn't exist. So let's put a little to-do right here and let's create our trace, uh, get traceback. 
This one, we're just going to be doing another static method because at this point, the idea is we don't care about probabilities. We don't care about anything stored. We don't care about what the alphabet is. We don't care about what the state is. None of that stuff matters to us. The only thing we care about is that traceback, and that traceback is just a list of dictionaries. So given the list of dictionaries and the very first step we were on, uh, we can create all the other steps. So to do this, I'm going to say def get traceback. And because it's a static method, I don't need to use self. All I'm going to do is traceback and last origin. Where did we come from? Okay. And now I'm going to do this string trick where I just say traceback is an empty string. And now I'm just going to add a bunch of stuff to this string. And then when I'm done, I'm going to give that string back to the program. So for pause in reversed, trace back, and I'm going to go from one, or from the very beginning all the way up to, but not including the very end. Now think, why would I skip that final, that final, uh, final position, the final item in the list? I'll give you a little Jeopardy moment. And if you feel like answering, go ahead and answer in chat. I'll take a drink of water while I wait, because I know there's a little bit of a delay. Have I lost you guys at any chance? Are you guys confused about anything? Or are you guys really liking what you're hearing so far? Gotta give me something. Talking for an hour and a half straight, two hours, it's a lot of work sometimes. Do I even have anybody watching? I got five. See, awesome, Alex. Yeah, I already got that final result. I already got that final item. Item. I got that with results, so I don't care about it anymore. So I'm just going to skip past it. I don't care about it anymore. Very astute. Yeah. Um. No, well, Hawkins, WD Hawkins, yeah, it, it, it does have a traceback because I did that right here, as Alex said. This was the first traceback. This was the very first time. And this is the only one in the traceback that we actually have to mathematically figure out. From here on out, we actually already have a roadmap because we've been keeping track of it with traceback, this list of dictionaries. This is the only one we actually have to mathematically figure out. So now we go through traceback uh, backwards using reversed. And uh, I'm going to say previous origin equals uh, whichever position I'm in. And then I'm going to say last origin. So this is the magic of this. This right here is the magic of figuring out your traceback. If you remember, uh, traceback is just a list of dictionaries. And a list of dictionaries, because it's a list, each index position maps to each individual base position of the sequence. So the very last uh, item of traceback maps directly to the very last uh, base in the sequence we looked at. Uh, so here we're saying, if I go through the traceback backwards, I also have the possibility of looking at the sequence backwards. So given that specific position within the traceback, the traceback is a dictionary or a list of dictionaries. So each dictionary uh, says, uh, from where I'm at, where did I come from? So here I'm saying, look at this dictionary, whatever this dictionary is, because here I'm going through the traceback backwards. So pause as a dictionary. Find out where I came from. Where was my last origin? And give me that again. So from here, all I do is say TB plus equals rev origin, and then last origin equals rev 
origin because we need to update and then it just keeps on iterating over and over and over again this is kind of like yeah this is just kind of like recursion but not because i don't like recursion and don't always try to go for recursion if you know how to write recursion great if you don't you don't have to trust me i've written a lot of code and not once have i ever done anything recursively besides stuff i had to do for class so once this is done this has gone through the entire traceback and created uh some unique string giving us that uh that optimal path now again if we think about on a scale concept in a scale kind of thing the problem here is that we're getting the entire traceback all at once so if we're give, we're dealing with a really 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 large sequence this can be potentially very very painful to process um but for the purposes of this class, uh, this is perfectly fine. If we wanted to fix that issue of making it more efficient, instead of saying, like right here, I can say return TB, and then that would bring that back up here and append it to result. What I could could do is a yield. I can say yield prev origin, yield prev origin, and then just update from here on out. So if you wanted to see that here, I could say yield, if I could spell. I could yield that prev origin, and then instead of worrying about this concatenation step, I now have a generator that would do it perfectly fine, and then every step along the way would just constant. Oops, sorry. Every step along the way would just update itself over and over again. The problem here is that I can't just do this simple concatenation up here because concatenations don't work with generators. So for the purposes of demonstration, this isn't specific particularly helpful. But in the purposes of uh scale this would be the optimal way to do that gonna okay. so now once this get trace back finishes it gets the entire trace back and pumps it back into this result so now we've appended everything to result now remember, we started at the very end. We started at the very end of the of the traceback. So when we have to give it back, we need to give it back reversed. Result. Just like that. And now as this stands, this Viterbi algorithm is complete. So from stem to stern, Viterbi algorithms made up, at least in my implementation, of three different portions. Now, I could have broken this right here up into another portion. It just didn't make sense. Generally speaking, my rule of thumb is if I have a for loop, I generally try to turn that into a separate function. But if you think about it in the grand scheme of things, this Viterbi, this is the only for loop within this function, so I should be okay. It's just a stylistic thing. It's not a big deal. Okay, so now that that's done, and I create my HMM using those uh, initial probabilities. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna do that just so you guys know. When you have these parentheses like this, you can press Enter after these commas to squeeze everything down to one line um, or it's down to multiple lines. Just make it a little bit more visually digestible. It's up to you guys though. Um, so now we have that. Let's. I've already created this model. I'm just going to copy and paste it. So. As you see, as it stands, nothing's wrong with my, my class. It hasn't done anything yet, but nothing's wrong with it. So if you go back to the, the, the class GitHub and on that Jupyter notebook that was actually provided for you guys for class seven, uh, with regards to HMMs. Here's some of the examples that were given. So here is the first sequence. This is the very first sequence. And I'm going to get this, I'm going to use the Viterbi based off this HMM that I've already created. I've already instantiated it using these probabilities we started up with up here, right? I haven't changed anything. This is my trained HMM, so to speak. 
And now I'm going to use that Viterbi algorithm using some sequence. Okay, so if you're kind of going, well, I don't know if that means anything or not, let me pull up the class for this. My internet doesn't like me streaming at the same time as I start surfing. So while I'm waiting for this, you guys give me some feedback. What do you, you feeling like this is pretty solid? Did I explain things good enough? Do you have any questions specifically about some of the stuff that's going on? I'm glad I have this little space heater. This has made it so much easier for me right now. Okay, so I am copying the expected output from the uh, notebook that was given to us in the class. And I will actually copy and paste that link here. That's the link to the notebook for anybody that's not involved in the class or whatever. Um, but going back, if I look at the expected output for this very example, we should be seeing, we should want to see something like this. Well, look at there. This is our Viterbi, and I'm telling you this right now. I haven't used any of uh, any of the instructions team's implementations. This was my own implementation. So I was kind of actually expecting a couple more bugs. Is there something wrong with my offset? May or maybe... Looks like I'm missing a G. Why would I be missing a G? See, this is what I get. I told you. I was expecting more bugs. There we go. What I think happened was in his, because like we already said, in mine, I took into account that we had already solved, like Alex said, we had already solved for that last position. And I think what happened was uh, this step may have potentially been uh, somewhat uh, overlooked when it came out to the expected output, but don't hold me to this. Again, I'm no math guru. This is literally something that Alan, had, he's done significant research on. So. I may very much be the one that is in the wrong here. Um, but based off of my implementation, if I skip that final one, uh, mine still looks pretty much identical except for that last trailing G. And we can look at the same things here. I don't care about the sequence. The sequence. I'm getting the same stuff. Yeah, it looks like mine is leaving off that last one now that I see it in with regards to the sequence. So if I remove that. And now it's catching them. So again, this is a little bit of the insight into seeing the way that I approach some of these problems. Uh, besides the dictionary comprehensions, which essentially, if we look back at this, I can turn any of these dictionary comprehensions into plain uh, for loops, and that's fine. I could say previous equals uh, dictionary, and I could say for state in self dot hidden states. And then I would say previous dot update, and then I would give it state. 
I would just do this right here. And with that in mind, these two lines, or I should say these three lines, essentially do the same exact thing as my dictionary comprehension does. It's the same exact language. I just split it up a little bit differently. Uh, but what's fun about this is that dictionary comprehensions are actually more performant than this method right here. Uh, I, I wish I knew exactly why, but I do know that they are. So take me at my word. Who knows? So in any case, this is an alternate method that you can use. But this right here does the same exact thing. I'm going to go over to chat and let's see what you guys are thinking. What do you guys, what do you guys feel about what's going on? That is pretty much the end of it. Unless you guys have anything else, if you want me to go over the other example that we had from the class where it seemed to be a whole lot more of an algorithm, we can do that, that's fine. Uh, or I should say a whole lot more of an initiation step. So the extended example of what we saw or in the uh, notebook for class is as such, bunch of fun, right? Thank you, Gia. WD Hawks. I feel... I feel like I should know who you are by your screen name, but I'm drawing a blank. I know Alex. I know Gia. I know Patrick was here, at least. I don't know if he's still here. I can't actually see who's logged in. Um... And then I'm just going to change this. Oh, I guess I can leave it as, as it is. Uh, the alphabet can go. CGT. But using the same concept, uh, going off of what the example was, and then given some sequence, parentheses, and here's some other. I'm not going to do this join because mine already comes out as a string. A bunch of places. Boom. So here, this looks like a bunch of, it looks like a bunch of garbage. And anybody that's not like math is like, it, they look at this and go, oh no, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Honestly, the numbers when it comes to hidden Markov models, don't really matter so long as they all add up to one, right? So if we're looking at initial probabilities, all of these just need to add up to one. If they don't add up to one, this doesn't really work that well. I guess you could leave one out, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, all of these should add up to one. And there's a fun thing about this is if you're ever messing around with a hidden Markov model and you're just trying to prototype some of the stuff or implement it, uh, implement it in different ways, and you want to play around with uh, seeing how your hidden Markov model reacts, you can actually use, well, let's see if I can find it right off the top of my head. Um, you can actually use uh, NumPy to quickly generate, uh, quickly generate probabilities that add up to one. Because that, again, that's the only, the only aspect of this that actually matters. 
So uh, we can do this using a, uh, a NumPy construct. It's called the, from NumPy.random, the Dirichlet. And what it says is that we're creating a num, uh, an array of uh, four ones. So at any other time, if you were to look at this just by itself, that's all it is. It's an array of ones. No big deal. Okay. And we're saying size six. So uh, the idea is I'm going to have six different arrays of four letters each in this in this respect, in, the, in this specific example. So it's six different and there's, so it's a, a four uh, column, six row table. And what Dirichlet does is it actually takes each of them and runs them and if you look across here, this right here, this one row sums to one. This one row sums to one every single time. And I can, I can show you that here too. Sum axis equals. Look at that. So what it did is it went across each of them in a row wise manner, added them all up and they all add up to one. Well, why I'm trying to show you this is that this right here gives us things that sum up to one. Well, these right here sum up to one. So what if I said from this, instead of size one, I said, or size six, I said size one. And then I have another thing. I know this is four, so I'm going to say ACGT, right? Put these together in a zip or I J in print I. Guess what we just did? We created a dictionary. Same thing. I could say, oh, this one's a hidden state. It's J and the key is some value. And that's going to be I and whatever. Oh, fun. So there's a really quick and easy way for you to come up with probabilities to play around with your hidden Markov model as you see it. Now, a question we got that I've gotten a couple of times about this, uh, the hidden Markov model, is this is all well and good. And in a toy environment where we're talking about M&Ms and Sick and Healthy and Seuss versus New York Times, that's all great. But what about real world applications? How do you get these numbers? How do you get these in real life? And honestly, that is a, a serious question, a seriously good question of the fact that you're thinking about it that way. Unfortunately, there's no easy way to answer it. How do you find out if a, a, if a dice is fair or a, a coin is fair? You kind of have to roll it or flip it a bunch of times in a frequentist manner. You have to do that. Um, this is no different when it comes to uh, HMMs. We can base it off of looking at all of our observations, tons of observations, and we can use, and based off of like a frequentist manner, we can actually comp uh, compute what these probabilities are based off of our observations that we've seen. Another method of this is using Bayesian inference, but that's stats, and I stay as far away from stats as possible. Uh, but you can look into that. Uh, however, if you have what you think are certain hypotheses uh, regarding what the weights are to your hidden Markov model, you can actually construct that hidden Markov model using some randomly gener generated uh, probabilities, and they don't need to be correct. But if you push them through an algorithm com called the Baum Welsh uh, Welch Alber algorithm, see if I can find it real quick. Hey, you guys have seen it in uh, your class lectures. Uh, but if you put your uh, Markov model uh, through this uh, Baumwelch algorithm, it can actually try to, it's an expectation maximization algorithm. 
And what it does is it tries to figure out what the uh, the best or the best starting point for your hidden Markov model. It tries to come up with sensible defaults for you uh, with regard to uh, uh, solving some of these unknown parameters. So if you know some of the steps, like what is the uh, transition probability for this specific state versus this specific state, it can try to fill in the blanks or fill in whatever. Uh, this is actually super important for our uh, for our class, and for those of you that are are interested in this, I strongly encourage you to look into uh, look into Bomb Welch. It'll be very important to you in the future if HMMs is something that uh, you're going to need. Outside of that, that was like two solid hours of coding, and you guys suffering with me as I try to fix my computer. So. Uh, if you have any other questions, I'm gonna move my move myself over to chat and just chill and chat with you guys for a second or two. And uh, other than that, I will call it a night. I'm thinking what I'm going to try to do is uh, get at least two office hour sessions in a week. So have like a a Tuesday office hours during some point in the middle of the day or whatever. Uh, and then you guys can kind of touch base on that with regards to what we've covered in class. Uh, the other stuff is like, we'll do a more deeper dive on like Friday or Saturday. Again, there's no hard set schedule here. It's like dependent on uh, when I can, hang out with my wife and when my wife's okay with me spending two hours on the computer on a weekend night. So uh, that's, that's a uh, very contextual, but if I can get two in, is that, would that be helpful material for you? And if I could change one thing in these office hours, what would you, what would it be for you? Something I can do differently or uh, anything like that. I want input. I like input. Input helps me go. And I know that a lot of times, especially when it comes to these uh, coding concepts, that it's just me talking at a screen uh, with very little interaction. It's not like some of these Twitch streamers that play video games and they're constantly getting like donations and tips and stuff like that from the people that are watching them and they're talking with everybody. This is very much material that is dry in general. <laughs> So the fact that you guys sat around and, and watched me fiddle around with my brand new keyboard that I, I can't seem to type on, uh, thank you. <laughs> it's just, uh, think about going outside to the forest and talking to a tree for two hours. That's sometimes how it feels. And uh, if you've never thought about talking to yourself, it's a, it's kind of a hard thing to learn, a hard skill set and what do you do about vocalized pauses do you say ums uhs and uh darnets and uh, uh or just dead silence the dead silence blows my mind sometimes stylistic tips sooner or later that you guys are just going to want me to teach python and not even worry about the algorithms it sounds like Yeah, just, <laughs> you got that right, Patrick. Uh, as far as that's concerned, just keep me in your prayers when it comes time for me to put myself up for this uh, GSI of the Year Award through Rackham next January. Crossing my fingers, but nobody in our department has ever won one, I don't think. Because we, we, we compete with, like, uh, uh, eeks and... Uh, school of information like people that gsi like classes of like hundreds of people 100 200 people in multiple sections it's kind of hard to compete with them not saying i'm trying to compete but just keep me in your mind okay well i'm gonna call it a night feel free to uh keep chatting up if 
if you do hang around, uh, it'll automatically transfer you to, or it'll transfer you to the next uh, streamer that is online right now. And most likely it's going to end up being like live from NASA up in the ISS or whatever space station. It is. No. Anyways, uh, but hang around, chill, relax, and stop worrying about programming for a little bit. And hopefully I've kind of uh, cleared up some of the issues that may have been hanging around with Hidden Markov models. And I'll see you guys next week.